Hello. What we're looking at in this video is how to analyse data that come in the form of frequencies of things, counts of things. And in particular, we're going to be looking at the use of a statistical test called the chi-square test to help us analyse frequency data. Let's start with an example. And this is some real data that I've dug up. This is possibly, arguably, yeah, probably the most important environmental epidemiology study ever published. Um, this is a paper that was published in 1950 by Richard Dole and Bradford Hill entitled Smoking and Carcinoma of the Lung. At the time that this paper was published, no one knew what was causing the epidemic of lung cancer that was being seen in the UK and Europe and in the USA and a number of other countries. There were a number of theories, but no one really had a good idea as to what was causing it. Richard Dole and Bradford Hill did a study where they found lung cancer patients in hospitals in London and they then found matched patients who were the same gender and from the same social class but who did not have lung cancer in the same hospital and they then asked them a series of questions one of which was how much do you smoke or if you do smoke how much do you smoke for the men they looked at almost all of the people they spoke to smoked at this time and so what they were able to generate was a set of data looking something like this. So this is just for men. And these are men who did smoke. And on the top row, you've got the men who had lung cancer. And on the bottom row, you've got the matched men who did not have lung cancer. And you've got the, the amount that they smoked divided up into groups. So one cigarette to four cigarettes, five cigarettes to four. 15 to 24, 25 to 49, and then more than 50 cigarettes a day. Just as an aside, for people who smoked but didn't smoke cigarettes, they had an arcane formula that they used to convert pipes or, or cigars into cigarette equivalents. So we've now got counts here. They've got percentages as well, but, they're, but the counts are what we're interested in. We've got counts of how many patients from the lung cancer group and the matched non-lung cancer group fell into each of these categories. So we had 33 patients with lung cancer who reported smoking between one and four cigarettes a day. We've got 190 patients without lung cancer who reported smoking between 15 and 24 cigarettes a day. Just looking at these data, it's kind of hard to see what's going on. So it's probably best to draw a bar plot that we can use. So this is the number of cases from the lung cancer group with the dark bars and the controls with the pale bars who smoked a particular number of cigarettes a day. And what you can see is that there seems to be a pattern. So if you look at the people who re reported smoking large numbers of cigarettes, so the more than 50 class or the 24 to 50 class, you can see that a lot more of the lung cancer patients fell into this category than the control patients. And equally, if you look at the classes of people who reported smoking small numbers of cigarettes per day, so the one to four class and the five to 14 class, you can see that in these groups, the number of control patients is higher than the number of lung cancer patients. And then if we look at the middle category, people reporting smoking 15 to 24 cigarettes a day, you can see that the numbers are roughly equal. So what does this mean? Well, it certainly looks like we have people with lung cancer reporting that they smoke more cigarettes than people without lung cancer, but who are also in hospital and matched with the, lung cancer with the lung cancer cases. Does this mean that we can draw any conclusions about a relationship between lung cancer and smoking large numbers of cigarettes? Well, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. What we don't know is how likely we would be to see a pattern like this simply by chance. If we did this study and there were actually no relationship between smoking and lung cancer, would we be likely to see a pattern like this? Would we simply get a few more patients in the large numbers of cigarette groups who had lung cancer by chance? And if we did, how likely would that be to happen? We don't, we don't know the answer to that. So we don't have a good idea of how confident we can be in the pattern that we're seeing here. What we need to do is some kind of analysis that will tell us the probability of seeing a pattern like this if in fact there were no actual association between having lung cancer and the number of cigarettes smoked. 
And in order to calculate this, what we need to do is produce something called a contingency table. This is a contingency table for our data. It's the same data as before, but we've added in the row totals and the column totals. And then we've also added in what we can call the grand total, which is the total number of cases counted in this entire study. So this is our contingency table. And what we can do with our contingency table is we can calculate the expected value for each cell in that table that we would expect to see if there were no association between our variables. So if there was no relationship between smoking and cancer, what numbers would we expect to see in each cell of this table? And we calculate this by taking the column total and the row total and dividing by the grand total. So for our top left cell, that one there, where we have 33 lung cancer cases in the one to four cigarettes per day category, the expected value is the column total, 88, multiplied by the row total, 647, divided by the grand total, which is 1,269. So our expected value is 44.87 for that particular cell of the table. So just looking at that expected value and the observed value, we can see that we've got rather fewer lung cancer patients in that particular cell of the table than we would expect were there no relationship between our two variables. So our expected value is rather bigger than our observed value, and we can calculate the difference between the two. The observed minus the expected is minus 11.87. And that's telling us that the observed value in this cell is rather smaller than we would expect were there no association between our variables. OK, but this is just one cell of the table. Um, what we need to do is get an overall feeling for what's happening in this data set. So we can calculate the observed value minus the expected value for every cell in our table. So let's do that. This is, this is what we get if we do that. I've now removed the row and column totals from the table again because we don't need them anymore. And just looking at this, we can see a pattern which kind of corresponds with what we saw in the graph. So if we just look at the lung cancer patients, then you can see that for the patients reporting smoking few, few cigarettes per day, we have rather fewer patients in that category with lung cancer than we would expect. And then if you look at patients reporting smoking very large numbers of cigarettes a day, you can see that we have rather more patients in that category than we would expect were there no association between our variables. So this is certainly leading us towards being able to quantify how much difference there is between our data and, we, and what we would expect to see if there was actually nothing really going on. So what can we now do now that we've calculated all of these differences? Well, we could just add them up. We could take the sum total of the differences between the observed and the expected values. And would that tell us anything useful about how different our data are from what we would expect were there no association? Well, no, it wouldn't, because in fact, if we just add up all those values, it comes to zero. Um, you can see some of these are negative, some of these are positive, and the positive ones cancel out the negative ones. So if we just add them all up, uh, we just get zero. So that isn't helpful at all. What we actually do is we take the square of each one and we add those up. So we take the square of the observed minus expected values and we add those together. And that then gives us a number where the negative numbers don't cancel out the positive numbers because when you square a negative value, it becomes positive. Um, but we still need to do something to these data, to, the, to this number that we've calculated to, to make it useful. And what we actually do is we divide by the expected value again and then we add all of those up. So we take the observed value for each cell, we subtract the expected value, we square that, we divide by the expected value, and then we take the sum of that value for each cell in the table. And that gives us a value which in this case is 36.95. If the null hypothesis is true, we would expect this value that we've calculated to fall on a chi-square distribution. So the chi-square distribution tells us the probability of getting a particular value for this if the null hypothesis is true. We're not going to talk about how the chi-square distribution is derived, but I'm showing you some examples here. Uh, the chi-square distribution with one, three, and five degrees of freedom. And you can see that the shape changes quite a lot 
as the number of degrees of freedom increases. For a particular chi-squared test or a particular chi-squared statistic, the number of degrees of freedom that you want to look at is equal to the number of rows in your contingency table minus one multiplied by the number of columns in your contingency table minus one. So in our case, we've got two rows and we've got five columns. So that means the number of degrees of freedom is one times four, which is four. So we want to look at a chi-squared distribution with four degrees of freedom. I plotted out the probability density of a chi-squared distribution on four degrees of freedom here, and I've drawn in a couple of values. One of these values tells us the part of the distribution where we would expect to find a value 95% of the time, and the next one shows us where in the distribution we'd expect to find 99% of values. So if we were to randomly draw lots and lots of values from a chi-squared distribution, we would expect 99% of them to be to have values lower than the value I've indicated there with the right-hand dotted line, and we would expect 95% of them to have values lower than the value I've indicated with the left-hand dotted line. So now we know this, we can say, well, where would our calculated value of chi-square fit on this probability distribution? And what does that tell us about the likelihood of observing that if the null hypothesis were true? Well, here is our calculated value of 36.95. And what you can see from looking at that is that the probability of getting a value of 36.95 or bigger if the null hypothesis of no association between the variables in our contingency table were true, that probability is going to be a very small number indeed. It's going to be much smaller, for example, than 0.01. Given that 0.05 is our conventional statistical cutoff for probability to say that we have statistical significance, then our chi-squared test is telling us that we have a statistically significant deviation from the null hypothesis of no association between smoking and lung cancer in the data set that Dolan Bradford Hill published. Let's go back to the Dolan Hill paper, and I'm going to show you that table again, but this time with the statistical analysis included. And you can see on the right hand side that they did exactly what we've just done. They did a chi-squared test, they calculated it on four degrees of freedom, and they're reporting it as having a p-value of less than 0 0.001. So in other words, that pattern that we're seeing, where the lung cancer patients in this group tend to be in the heavy smoking categories, and the non-lung cancer patients tend more to be in the light smoking categories, that pattern that we're seeing is very unlikely to have arisen just by sampling error. OK, obviously we don't always want to do chi-squared tests by hand, although it's one of the easiest one of the easiest statistical tests to do by hand. If we want to do a chi-squared test with R, then we want to put our data into a matrix. So we need, we need to put the data in a matrix with the number of rows and columns, which is the same as we would have for the contingency table we've just been looking at. And then you can use the chi-square test function. And the chi-square test function gives you the results of a chi-squared test. And you can see that the numbers that R has, cal has calculated down at the bottom are the same as the numbers that we calculated, with the exception that we now have an exact p-value uh, of 1.84 times 10 to the minus 7, which again makes the point that the probability of observing a pattern like this, or more extreme, is very, very small indeed, if the null hypothesis were true. Thank you.